Welcome to The Dirt on Organic Farming, a podcast from the Organic Agronomy Training Service. Our aim is to bring skeptical agronomists and crop consultants into the organic conversation by analyzing six common criticisms and openly discussing the sometimes messy promise of the organic opportunity. The podcast format combines expert interviews with real world examples to get beyond us versus them and towards a more informed understanding of organic agriculture. I'm Nate Powell-Palm. And I'm Mallory Krieger. We're the hosts of The Dirt on Organic Farming. I would say that's the greatest fear that without herbicides, they, you know, the farm could turn into a weedy mess, as you say. So I most often hear skeptics of organic weed management saying that it's not cost effective, take too much time, and that the field will become a weedy mess and create problems for neighbors. In this episode, Unsightly Fields, Organic is a Weedy Mess. General Mills is a proud sponsor of oats. As the largest producer of natural and organic packaged food in the U.S., the company is committed to supporting farmers in transitioning to organic and promoting continuous improvement of organic standards and practices. Learn more at generalmills.com. Oats is brought to you with funding support from Stonyfield. As the country's leading organic yogurt maker, Stonyfield takes care with everything it puts into its products and everything it keeps out. By saying no to toxic, persistent pesticides, artificial hormones, antibiotics, and GMOs, Stonyfield is saying yes to healthy food, healthy people, and a healthy planet for 38 years. Stonyfield is a certified B Corp and is also helping to protect and preserve the next generation of farmers and families through programs like its Direct Milk Supply and Wolf's Neck Organic Training Program, as well as Stony Fields, a nationwide multi-year initiative to help keep families free from toxic, persistent pesticides in parks and playing fields across the country. Last episode, Nate, you took us on a deep dive into the use of and effects of tillage in organic systems. Now, as we talked about in that episode, that tillage conversation primarily exists because of the need to control weeds. That's the number one use of tillage in organic systems. And weed control is a, it's a different beast in organic farming than it is on the conventional side. Absolutely. And that's probably the biggest fear I hear from transitioning farmers is that weeds will be impossible to control and will make it ultimately impossible to get a good yield. I have lived my entire life near the one of the best farming cleanest field seed potato growing communities that I can think of in the whole country. And um, every time one of my neighbors would hear that I was interested in organics or was going to try a little organics in a field near them, they got really nervous about, oh, is it going to be really weedy? Is it going to be a weedy mess? Um, And in the beginning, you know, it probably was. There were some weeds. There's There's a transition, a growth period where you're trying to figure out how do I culturally manage these weeds specific to this field. But as you get deeper in, my experience has been, as you get to know a field better, as you get a few years of rotation under your belt in that field, weeds are manageable. And at this juncture, I'm pretty much uh, not not a pariah, but a, a real curiosity to a lot of my neighbors because they're interested, how can you actually grow a good crop that gets a good yield that's also clean without any herbicides. And that's where the organic conversation really gets interesting with them. Well, I spoke with a number of experts on this topic. um, And the first one that I approached is Dr. Kathleen Dellett. She's a professor of organic agriculture at Iowa State University. And I spoke with her to get a sense of how organic farmers can control weeds. You have to use a systems approach. So it's a uh, multifaceted approach to weed management, including things like crop rotation. So when you rotate your crops, the weeds can't get a hold in that particular crop year. And then you also can use cover crops like rye, which has allelopathic properties that help mitigate against weed seed germination and growth. And 
finally, compost is often shown to have some allelopathy too. So that's a big part of the system's approach to managing weeds. The term allelopathy that Kathleen uses refers to the ability to suppress the growth of plants. And so in this whole systems approach that Kathleen is describing, um, organic weed control, it really comes down to timing. You want to manage your weeds as early as possible. As a matter of fact, the first time you manage them, it's called the white thread stage. It's just where the little tiny white cotyledon is coming out of the weed seed. That's when you want to get away and hit it for the first time. So hit it early and then hit it often in the beginning phases. That will help decrease your weed populations. Okay, so we know that we need to manage weeds early, but I'm thinking from the viewpoint of our listener, what are some of the other practices that really give weeds a run for their money? Let's talk about what tools we do have to disrupt the weed life cycle to really get to that point of a good, clean field. Well, I took that question to Dr. Adam Davis. He's the chair of the Department of Crop Sciences at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And he's an agricultural ecologist who works to develop ecological weed management systems. During the period of crop growth, you know, when it's planted from the, to the time it's harvested, that's basically a safe zone for weed growth. That planting operation when you're preparing the seed bed and then the harvest operation are both times that are pretty dangerous for weeds. And so what you tend to have happen is that you have weeds that dominating a particular phase of a crop rotation that are similar to the crop. So if you've got a summer annual crop like corn, then you get a summer annual weed like common water hemp growing in it. Or if you've got a winter annual crop like winter wheat, then you'll get a winter annual weed uh, like henbit or uh, chickweed, right? And so if you only were growing a summer annual crop year after year after year, you would end up with a situation where your summer annual weeds become too comfortable and their weed seed bank builds up too much. But if you begin switching between summer annual crops, crops, winter annual crops, perennials, legumes, crops with different stat statures, you begin to fragment the weed community and make it harder and harder for any one weed species to become really dominant. And that's the goal of integrated weed management is to kind of bring the different members of that weed community down to manageable levels. And so a diverse cropping system really does that well. So I think my takeaway from this would be that there's actually a pretty diverse toolkit that gives farmers more options to get clean fields than just in real cultivation. Yes. And Dr. Davis also pointed out that relying on one single approach can be the downfall of an organic system. There are a number of strategies that I wish more organic farmers would use to control their weeds. Um, I, I think that to develop a really successful long-term weed management approach for organic production systems, uh, you need to think about developing a diverse toolkit and not relying too much on any one tool. One of the most common mistakes that I see on organic operations with respect to weed management is people relying too much on cultivation, on mechanical cultivation for weed control. You know, so that's kind of their silver bullet, and they go to it again and again and again. And when I first started in this position, um, an organic grower came to me with a really out of control giant ragweed problem on their farm. And I dug into it a bit, and it turned out that what had happened was um, the grower had used cultivation so much without using other methods that the giant ragweed population had evolved so that it was now emerging throughout the entire growing season rather than in the early spring, like many giant ragweed populations. She had basically created a cultivation-resistant population of giant ragweed. So this is a pitfall for organic growers, and the principles of integrated weed management are actually the same, regardless of whether you're an organic grower or a conventional grower. You need to use cultural, biological, 
physical and sometimes chemical techniques. So when we consider everything out there from tillage to crop rotations and cover crops, we've got some serious benefits for weed management, but none are 100% effective, right? So in conventional systems, farmers can head back out to the field with later applications of herbicide to spot control weeds that break through. Um, but what options do organic farmers have when faced with a real dire situation? I mean, like just an ocean of weeds in a given field. Yeah. So the options that organic farmers have for for that situation are somewhat limited. But I did talk to Dr. Dellett and Dr. Davis both about what tools are available for organic growers in terms of rescue treatments. Yeah. So one of the things that's happened in the upper Midwest uh, because of people's over-reliance on cultivation for weed control and organic systems is that we do see actually a lot more giant ragweed around. A lot of end of season weeds that got pushed towards the end of the season by all the early season cultivation. And so that has increased the need for chopping crews. Um, so the weed zapper is a device that is powered by, it's actually a static electricity device that develops really large voltages. And then when grounds with a weed can basically explode it, the videos of the weed zapper working at night are very entertaining. You see sparks flying. It only really works on pretty large weeds. It doesn't work for carpets of small weeds. And that's an important point that you should rely on rescue weed management because by the time you've gotten to a weed that's large enough for the weed zapper, you've already lost most of your yield. So all you're doing at that point is preventing seed return by the weed. Dr. Davis makes a good point. Technologies like the Weed Zapper are flashy and interesting and frankly, really fun to use. But weed management in organics is most effective at preserving yield if it's done on time, which means early. Did you learn about any innovations in primary weed control? Yes. Dr. Davis and I also talked about automated weeding robots. And yes, they are developing robots for farming. The robots that are work, being worked on by the company EarthSense, uh, Gareth Chowdhury and I have been uh, working together on weeding robots. These are designed to work continuously, 24-7, on very small weeds. And so I wouldn't call it a rescue treatment. In fact, I would call it exactly what you need to do in organic weed management, which is kind of continuous attention to new flushes of weeds and get them before they steal your yield. So weed zappers and robots are not the only flashy weed control implement going on in organic agriculture right now. Dr. Dellett also brought up propane flame burners. I would say two things. You have to be a pyromaniac and love fire because it can be a little intimidating when you see the flames coming out of the back of the machine. Um, and you also have to play around with it to know exactly when your plants can tolerate it. Corn can take a lot of damage um, in the early stages if you have if you burn it a little with the flame weeder because its uh, growing point is way down in the whirl of the plant and it can reemerge after flaming. But with soybeans, all the growing tips are right on the edge, so if you burn them with the flame burner, you can set them back. So I know a couple people that have mastered flame burning, but I would say it's not for the faint of heart and definitely you should work with an experienced uh, farmer first to before you break out the flame weeder. And when all else fails, consider just starting over. If your field does get too weedy, you might consider what's called a fallow year. And that is a year where you don't grow a crop to sell. Your sole purpose is to Cut down on your weeds, your weed seed bank, and get that field prepped for a commercial crop the next year. So we had to do that once, and um, I learned from an organic farmer in Illinois, Dave Campbell, the best way to do it was to plant a um, summer cover crop of sorghum Sudan grass. 
And again, that plan has a lot of allelopathy, but also it has this tremendous tillering ability. So it just fills the entire field with tillers and you can cut and it grows really rapidly and you can come in and cut it at three feet high and it'll regrow. And that's what we did. And it was amazing. It, because we had a thistle problem in that field and it just wiped out the thistle. It's competed with the thistle so heavily um, that the next year we went in with the oat and alfalfa crop and it grew really well. We had a couple thistles left, but nothing like what it was before we put it into that summer fallow. Our whole soul, our sole purpose was to control the thistle that summer and not produce a saleable crop. I will say that as a cattle guy, I identify so much with this this issue that if you have a really weedy field, maybe it's time to get that field a year off. And so being able to hay it off to export that weed bank to get rid of that that weed pressure in any way you can is often the best option. So we just heard an awesome amount of info from the researchers. But did you get a chance to talk to any farmers who are struggling with weeds, overcoming these challenges with weeds? I'd be super interested to hear about weeds from this working farmer perspective. I am so glad you asked, Nate. You know, I find it to be the most valuable to my learning to hear from a working farmer who is using these practices in real time. So let's find out what our farmer had to say. My name is Wilden Randall Hughes. I go by Randy to keep me separate from all the other Wilden Hugheses there are in our family. I am the fifth one uh, and the fifth generation farmer. My son is a sixth generation farmer along with my daughter, Julianne. Uh, I went to school at the University of Wyoming, got a degree in general ag and came back home to be actually a beef producer. And uh, we just weren't able to make that work. And so I started concentrating on crops. Uh, we now have about 5,000 acres that we farm. And uh, it is uh, about 50-50 organic or transitional, organic, transitional, and conventional. Uh, we're moving more and more towards the organics uh, as we are able to learn better how to do it and able to take that many acres on. It's, it's, it's a lot of work, obviously. It's hard for one person to run as many acres organically as they do chemically, that's for sure. And so as our labor pool has grown and uh, as uh, my children have come online, we're able to take on more and more organics. So we currently do a lot of specialty stuff. Uh, we do some vegetable crops for a local canning factory, peas, uh, snap beans, sweet corn, beets, uh, lima beans, those sorts of things. We also have blue corn that we make into our own tortilla chip. We take the corn and take it to a uh, uh, factory and they grind it up and make it into chips and we distribute it under our, our own bag and label throughout the Midwest. And then we grow quite a bit of white corn for the chip industry connections that I've gotten through doing the blue chips. We also grow quite a bit of white corn uh, that goes into the chip uh, world. And then we're trying to do more and more small grains as a, as a weed buster, as a soil enhancer, those sorts of things. So we have a very diverse operation, I guess you would say, but it's only crops. We don't have any livestock. Another reason why I wanted to talk to Randy is because he's not 100% organic. He maintains some conventional acres. And so he's a really great resource for comparing experience on both organic and conventional land. Well, and I think that's in and of itself a little bit of a mini myth in organics that you have to be 100% organic. I think a lot of operators have split operations and it's enough organics to meet their operational style that they don't go overboard, they don't take their entire operation organic, but find a happy balance. That's true. And Randy shared with me his reasons for why he has a split operation. When people say to me, you know, geez, are, are you 100% organic? No, we're not. Oh, you hypocrite. How can you possibly do that? Tell us about the advantages of organics and all these kinds of things. Well, I just told you why it doesn't work on a slopey field that's kind of low because you can't get in there to do a good job. Uh, if it's slopey, you've got erosion issues when you need to get take care of the weeds and tillage is your only friend at that point. You don't need them washing away just to prove that you're not going to use chemicals. So some pieces really do lend themselves better to it. Now, you can get it done with grass. You can get it done with strip cropping. You can, you can get it done uh, organically. Absolutely, you can. But it, it truly does lend itself well to the higher ground, especially if it's irrigated and it's flat. Then you can get in there and get those things done. You know, I think all farmers hate weeds because weeds are thieves. They steal your profits. 
and we control is harder in organic. So I would be interested to hear what's going on in Randy's field. What does it look, actually look like on the ground? Well, it really depends on the crop, but a lot of time he says that you can't tell the difference. You know, we've been fortunate. I'm just trying to think the last few comments and the last few comments was, boy, that's pretty clean uh, fields they got. They look great. We grew some sunflowers and sunflowers are very good uh, competitors with just about any weed. And that farm you saw zero weeds. They were down underneath the canopy, of course, just like they are in a chemical farm or conventional farm. But uh, the comments are actually quite good. That, that doesn't mean that we don't have our problems and that we haven't had an issue. We do. And, you know, when somebody says it's just a weedy mess, you know, an organic farmer might say, you know, the conventional farming is just one big pollution chemical mess. Well, no, it's not. But if it's done improperly, it can be. And if organic farming is done improperly or the weeds get ahead of you or you have a bad year, then, yeah, yeah geez, yeah, we can have uh, blowouts in the organic industry as you can in the chemical industry. But when you go by my hay field, you wouldn't know that it was any different than a chemical or an organic farm. Uh, when you go by the sunflower farm, you wouldn't know it. When you go by a, uh, a soybean farm that's on some slightly heavier ground where we weren't able to get into rotary hoe and cultivate and do all those kinds of things, yeah, yeah, you bet they get weedy. And soybeans, of course, are out there the whole season, but they don't compete. Uh, as well as maybe corn or something for light and those sorts of things. That's super interesting. I wonder what about yields, though? Like, how are we doing on yields when we're talking about these weedier but manageable systems? Well, a lot of times Randy finds that his yields are pretty similar between his conventional and his organic ground. I think that organically I can compete very well with conventional stuff, especially if we were plowing up a crop of hay. That's a classic example because... When you take up a crop of hay, the weed cycle has been, uh, you know, has, has all changed. You, you know, you haven't tilled it for a while. You've got quite a bit of uh, angleworm life down there. The soil structure has recovered from any tillage that was done when it was too wet or those kinds of things. If it's been three or four years of hay, not to mention the nitrogen that's in there and then uh, the lack of rootworm that would be around there. And so when you plant the, the organic corn and the conventional corn, side by side, you can, you can do it. They're, they're very comparable. Now, before you jump in, Nate, obviously there are no guarantees. And despite all of his years of experience, there are times where things just didn't work out and Randy had to cut his losses. So obviously when corn's chest high and the ragweeds are chest high, you don't have a plan. So I don't mind confessing that we had 60 acres this year where the weeds won we lost it. We plowed down 60 acres of sunflowers because the rags just had a tremendous year out there. And we had that situation where we couldn't get in there and do our, our mechanical tillage because of the rain. We just couldn't get there. And then it got really hot and warm. And man, the giant rags just took off and got out ahead of the sunflowers. Sunflowers uh, need a lot of warmth. They like warm weather. And rags can grow when it's not so warm. So there was a time out there when it was wonderful for the rags to grow, but not good for the sunflowers to grow. And so they caught up to them. Rags are very aggressive and they're also quite prolific. So when all of those things germinate, why they do well. And what we decided was our money would be best spent out there to plow that down, which we did. We dissed it down and then we watered it. You know, you've got a crop failure. Why are you spending money irrigating? Well, the answer is to germinate all the other weed seeds that are out there. It's like, and, and then we'll till those in. So we germinate, we watered them and the weeds came up and we're killing millions of weeds out there. It's like going out with a, with a, a, a roundup machine and the tillage kills them. And then you go up and you do that two or three or four times. Now, the top three or four inches, that eh, doesn't have so many weed seeds in it. So then we put barley in there. And barley has an aleopathic effect, kind of like rye or those sorts of things. And I expect that field that we lost to weeds last year to be a pretty decent field of barley. You know, I didn't come up with this phrase, but I love it when farmers say, I keep cows around so they can eat my farming mistakes. And I think that really speaks to this idea of having a backup plan when you do need to cut your losses. So you're not just left with nothing, but rather you're helping the soil in some way prepare for another chance to grow another crop. Um, I think I can pretty definitively state that organic farming is darn complicated. But I'd love to hear from the horse's mouth, how does Randy keep a handle on so many moving parts in such a complicated system? So once you know what your weed seeds are, uh, what your, what's in your weed bank, 
and what it takes to get those, why then we, we uh, try to get after them. You know, we've got a book that was written in 1910, and it's, uh, it's just a book on farming. And it, it, it is something that I use fairly often because it has the, I'll call it the old school way of controlling weeds. If you get on the internet right now, how do you take care of ragweed? They're going to give you a list of chemicals. But when you look in this book, it talks about uh, its life cycle, when it's most vulnerable, how prolific the seeds are. The description in there on thistles that talked about when you can cut the thistle before it goes to seed, but it'll actually stop it. If you cut thistles too early, they just come back and they head out. Uh, you know, you'll have twice as many seeds out there. If you cut them too late, you might chop them down. Your field looks nice, but laying on the ground is this white puff full of uh, viable seeds, and you've just be- become part of the problem. If you work thistles in the spring with a disc, you they're, because they're rhizomes, you chop them up and you spread it. You may as well be out there with thistle seeds spreading them. So you have to understand about how the weed works, and these older books will tell you that. It's out there. It's just not as easy to find as it is to find the spray that goes on them. So. So essentially, Randy spends a lot of time and a lot of energy researching and learning so that he can have a, um, a positive and productive and profitable organic farming experience. And it sounds like that Randy always has a backup plan as well, that even though he's pretty good at weeds and he's, you know, he was working hard to understand them, there's situations you can't control, so you need to figure out what your next move is. When I think about the way Randy describes his weed management system, it sounds like in a real way that that's also how an agronomist could be thinking about it, how someone who a farmer calls up and asks for advice um, could be stepping in and and helping farmers troubleshoot these weedy situations. Really good place-based informed advice on how do we tackle these complicated moving parts. I totally agree with you, Nate. You know, qualified advisors for organic farmers are in really short supply, and there is so much good information out there. And many of the farmers that I've worked with in the past and talked to really struggle with how to put it all together into a plan for their unique farm, because every farm is different. Every farmer's crop rotation is slightly different. Their weed control strategies are slightly different. And so um, there isn't like a plug and play plan for weed control that an organic farmer can rely on. And so Dr. Davis, who we heard from earlier, pointed out that farmers really need to work to create a plan to control weeds from the very start. It's perfectly possible to have a farm, a large scale farm that's productive and organic with well-managed weeds. And I know several farmers, you know, with 3,000 plus acre farms, who do this, but it requires a plan and it requires putting this dedication to paying attention to your weeds right up at the front of your task list, not at the very end of your task list. For people who are coming out of uh, conventional production and transitioning into organic, one of the things that I think is really important is to start small and not dive in so that you're overwhelmed and always playing catch up. You know, it is it is the long game in organic weed management. Um, if you make a proactive plan that's comprehensive, that um, really makes use of each of those different types of tactics, um, you can have a long term plan that where the weeding is not an undue burden and that you're preserving your crop yield. So preventing weeds in organic systems is just as important as managing weeds. So hearing from Randy and Dr. Dellett, I'm getting a picture that they're clearly working from a different baseline than, say, my conventional farming neighbors. In the conventional world, as I think everyone could agree, basically the mantra is no weeds are acceptable. The only good field is a clean field. And it sounds fundamentally that that is different in organics. Yes. And, you know, just to restate that, in any context, successful weed management does not mean zero weeds in organic. And Dr. Davis talks about what this kind of looks like realistically. If you create a plan that is 
based on a really good diverse crop rotation with healthy crops, and then you begin working other tools into it, you can expect to you know, minimize yield losses, keep them down in the 10 to 15 percent range. Um, getting up into the mid 90s is generally pretty unrealistic uh, for um, you know 95 percent weed suppression, for example, reducing crop yield losses to five percent. It's it's probably unrealistic for most organic growers. So successful weed management in organic systems does not mean a field without weeds, but it does mean that you're not getting to a point where so many weeds are coming up in a single flush that you can't even get your cultivator through, right? That the, weed, the field is choked out or that you've got so many late emerging weeds that even after the canopy closed, you can't get in there and now you've got you know, tons of weed seed coming out. Instead, what we're looking for is to reach some kind of stable equilibrium where we've got low populations, they manage, they replace themselves, but we don't see the population growing rapidly. So when I manage weeds uh, in my own studies, I'm looking at population growth rates. I'm trying to either have a stable or declining population growth rate over time. For me, that's success. I would say that I think about tillage and the control of weeds in a really similar way in that when talking about weeds, less is more. So I don't look at how do I absolutely eliminate weeds, but how do I fundamentally hit a a really nice steady state where the weeds aren't costing me yield, but I'm not wasting money overdoing it and trying to eradicate them. Yeah. So when we're talking about success with weed management, we're talking about profitable farming. Whatever level of weed control allows you to remain profitable that's the right level of weed control for your specific farming context. And this is a balance that Randy has to navigate every day. We could do it, but you've got to understand that no weeds isn't necessarily economically logical. We could go out and pull them all. You can hire it done. There's, there's detasseling. Clarus are out detasseling. When they're done, they can come and pull all your weeds. So now you've got, you know, $600 worth of weeding and a $500 crop, uh, you know, it just doesn't flow by the time you do your other expenses, it, it just it just doesn't pay. So having a field that isn't quite as pretty is something that we have to live with. You, one year at a time, we can do it to have a field that is always as clean with every crop, with every weather condition. No, no, probably can't. Not unless I wanted to spend a lot of money showing off for the neighbors. But uh, I'm in it to, to make a living, too. And if we want to get really out there in our perspective on weeds, Dr. Dellett mentioned that there may be even some benefits to weeds. That is a very uh, tricky, sensitive subject for most farmers because they believe that all weeds are bad. So um, I say this with some hesitation that there are some benefits to weeds. Um, weeds can be a host for a lot of beneficial insects. They can provide nectar and pollen and their flowering parts for beneficial insects. Also, weeds are plants that have roots and they often have extensive root systems that do provide some organic matter. And um, there have been people that have gone in and grazed animals on weedy plots too. So there are some benefits. So keeping your weeds under control so that you have you know, maintained some level of weeds out there, but not enough to impact the yield is really critical. I really love thinking about this gap in, in the baseline where on one side, the only good field is a clean field. And on the other side, we have a pretty healthy tolerance for weeds that it's not a terrible thing to have some weed presence because you're still making money. Right. And Dr. Dellett stressed that weed management in organics really comes down to farmers shifting their thinking about what an acceptable weed presence looks like in their fields. I mean, to me, it's just a, it's a change in mindset. I and mean, over and over, I hear from transitioning farmers, organic farmers, that the main change for them is a change in their mindset to where you can tolerate some level of weeds and you can deal with your neighbor's criticism because chances are they're, they're 
there will be some neighbors that will criticize if you have some weeds out there. I mean, I get it at our farm um, in Greenfield, Iowa, but we post signs, this is organic farm. We talk to the neighbors. They understand that we're going for the organic premium. Money talks, that's usually the thing that gets people's minds open to it, that you can make three times the returns in organic, and we have the data to prove that. So um, hopefully showing people the evidence, you can change their mindset to be a little more open-minded about weeds. Man, you covered a ton of ground in this episode, Mallory. I'm, I'm grateful for the perspectives we heard on this. And I think this episode also gives us a really cool opportunity to really explore how we're thinking about and how we're approaching our biggest challenges as farmers. And weed's one of them. Absolutely, Nate. It's been a huge amount of information from Randy and our experts in this episode. And so thinking back on talking with with these really knowledgeable people, I've kind of narrowed down all of this information into kind of the three most core takeaways for successful weed management in organics. And the first is that if you want to be a successful manager of weeds and organics, you've got to get to know your weeds. You have to know what's present in your fields, what their patterns of germination are, and how they respond to your management techniques. The second important takeaway is that you have to have a wide variety of management techniques in your toolbox. Don't rely too heavily on any one single management tool because that can actually lead to weed management problems of its own. And the third takeaway that I have pulled out from these conversations is that managing weeds is fundamentally different than eliminating weeds. In organics, we're trying to be profitable farmers, not weed-free farmers. So we've got to adjust our outlook and mindset on what it means to manage weeds in organics. That profitability component that both you just mentioned and Randy talked about it hit me kind of hard, actually, because there's so much to the way that farmers have been told to think about weeds and think about their farms. There's there's such a, a dogma to you're not good enough unless you're a clean farmer. And I think that when you combine that you're going to make more money if you just let off a little bit on the weeds, if you can figure out where that steady state is, you're more profitable, but that part that you get to be more profitable, but also create a safer farming environment for your family, that is honestly why I'm in this game. Yes. And while economics are crucial for Randy, there's also something deeper and more there in organics for him. It is harder. It's more intensive. It's made me a a better, more aware farmer of how soil works and how mother nature works. You know, when you're when you're organic farming, it feels like you're you're working with Mother Nature instead of trying to beat her at your own game. It's just this most wonderful feeling. It 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 really is. And when your kids are out there, nobody's you no know, dogs are licking their paws and getting sick. You don't worry about the kids, you don't worry about anything. It's just it's wonderful. It is just a great feeling. And you feel really good about what you are doing for the environment or what you are sure that you're not doing, however you want to look at it. It's just as a, it's a delightful feeling. That was episode two of The Dirt on Organic Farming, a new podcast by the Organic Agronomy Training Service. OATS provides organic grain production training to agronomists, advisors, and crop consultants so that farmers will have better access to reliable, science-based advice for their unique farm operation. Special thanks to Randy Hughes, Dr. Kathleen Dellett, and Dr. Adam Davis. This episode was produced by Michaela Elias. For more information, go to www.organicagronomy.org. OATS is brought to you with funding support from Cliff Bar. Cliff Bar's journey to use organic ingredients started in 2003. We've learned along the journey that organic can be a catalyst for good. 
It is key to creating a healthier, more just, and sustainable food system for all of us. Organic farming is good for people and the planet. We've also learned that organic farming is innovative and can play a critical role in feeding a growing world. In order to do that, organic has to continue to improve. That's why we are the number one private funder of organic research in the U.S. and fund projects like OATS. We are proud to be working along with all of you to ensure that organic is here to stay for good and for generations to come. OATS is brought to you with funding support from King Arthur Baking Company, who has been sharing the joy of baking since 1790. A certified B Corp, headquartered in Vermont, King Arthur is the ultimate baking resource, providing the highest quality ingredients for the most delicious baked goods. As a 100% employee-owned baking company, we believe in the power of baking to make a difference for our employee owners, the larger baking community, and the planet. We strive to be a force for good in all that we do, from cultivating a workplace that embraces differences and prioritizes trust, to teaching children across the country how to bake bread from scratch, to partnering with farmers and suppliers who share our vision for a greener planet. OATS is a programmatically independent consortium that is fiscally sponsored by the Organic Trade Association. OTA serves as an anchor funder for OATS through its industry-invested Grow Organic Research, Promotion, and Education program. Grow Organic's Technical Assistance Program area seeks to meet goals of scalability, regional, and production system diversity in technical assistance for organic and transitioning farmers nationwide. Top donors to the Grow Organic Technical Assistance Program area help make OATS possible. Thank you to General Mills, Cliff Bar, Stonyfield, King Arthur Baking Company, and Organic Valley. I'm Mallory Krieger. And I'm Nate Palapalm. Till next time, thanks for listening. Thank you.